But let us turn to our theme uh, for this session. And uh, it is, as you've seen, um, back to the office, not so fast, um, because it is about the critical issue that faces any agency leader, either now or in the very near future, about whether you should bring your team back to the office as they used to be, or whether you should work remotely, or whether you should adopt a hybrid version of that, or somewhere in between. Um, but before we get onto that, and uh, we, uh, I, I bring in my kind of esteemed panelists, I just wanted to give you a little thinking and context. Um, let me start with this. As we all know, no agency likes to lose its biggest account. Uh, we've probably, most of us, been in agencies where it's happened. And sometimes it knocks the stuffing out of an agency. You know, it declines, it sells, or it folds. Remember Bell Pottinger, anybody? Uh, but we've also seen cases where a big setback actually energizes an agency. The team pulls together. The agency becomes hungrier for new business. It begins to question outdated practices and ways of working. And in some ways, the pandemic is similar. Some negative trends for agencies have been accelerated. Asset strippers have moved in to agency. Holdings and clients continue to in-house more and more agency services. The network holding companies, one might think, and I'm a little biased here, I do confess, one might think they are somewhat whistling in the dark. Last week, Omnicom announced year-on-year -year quarterly organic revenue growth of over 11.5%. Pretty impressive, but not to the markets, because last year their revenue declined by the same amount. So over two years, they had zero growth, and their stock price three days after the announcement has fallen about 8%. So about a billion dollars has or more has been wiped off their market cap. Things are changing. Despite vaccines, lockdowns, masks, and better treatments, the pandemic is still a crisis. But out of a crisis, there also comes opportunity. And independent agencies are well-placed to capitalize. Clients are spending again. They have to, to rebuild lost sales. Um, Clients are looking for new solutions, new ideas, new uses for technology and data, more agility from their professional services providers, all of which means opportunities for agencies and especially for independents. We've been forced to modernize our ways of working. We have the cloud instead of that big old server cupboard and those filing cabinets stuffed with paper. We have Zoom and Teams and Hopin and Slack. And if life all gets a bit too serious, we have TikTok. But ultimately, agencies are not driven by technology. They're driven by people. 60% of the revenue of every agency that's on this webinar goes on people costs. And people's lives, their expectations and demands are changing. We have to take into account that we are the lucky ones. Arguably, today's social divide is between people who need to work in person, like nurses, hospitality workers, delivery drivers, and cleaners. These are the new working classes, cynically rechristened by politicians as essential workers or key workers to make them feel better. Distinct from the professional classes like lawyers, accountants, and public relations consultants who can choose whether to work in person or remotely from Portugal or Barbados. Well, we are the fortunate ones because we can choose. But choice, can also be a curse. Laurence Olivier, the world's greatest Shakespearean actor, defined Hamlet, Shakespeare's greatest play, as the tragedy of a man who could not make up his mind. To be or not to be. To return to the office or not to return to the office. That is the question. And if you as agency leaders don't make that choice, other people will make it for you. Your clients, for example. At the beginning of the pandemic, many clients who kept their own staff in their offices excluded its external people from visiting, out of sight, out of mind, and there's little doubt that this accelerated the progress of in-housing. Sometimes it can help agencies. Agencies who are asked to pitch virtually no longer have many of the non-recoverable travel and presentation costs traditionally associated with a competitive review. 
On the other hand, last week, I heard from an agency in Paris that their Swiss client had asked for a reduction in fees because they could see on their team's calls that the agency was saving money by having people work remotely. So they asked directly for a 10% reduction in hourly rate for people working from home. Well, we have to make our decisions clearly and present our rationale very carefully. Reality and perception are equally important as PR professionals, we know that. We have to think smart. We have to watch for new trends. We at the Network One are offering our office for rent partial of part of the week through a new company called 3 Plus 2, set up last month to facilitate office shares by two companies who each only want their office people in the office two or three days a week, like us. On another idea, take a look at Vicoland, fascinating company. It's, uh, you find the URL, it's, it's spelt like it says, Vicoland. It's a German company that creates multi-country virtual companies and actually principally agencies out of freelancers. They find them from different countries. They sort out all the technology, the tax and the legal issues, and they offer their services to corporate clients as agencies on very flexible terms at very competitive rates, all working remotely. Interesting. But here's our biggest problem of all, and it's a new problem, which we hear reported right now from agencies all over the world. Agencies are in a talent crunch. We let people go. We furloughed them. We asked senior people for salary sacrifices. We got loans from our governments to pay the salaries of people who weren't working. Because at the beginning, clients were paralyzed by understandable fear and indecision and cancelling marketing and communications budgets. Now the clients are back and we want our people back, but they've gone. And it's estimated, widely estimated, that 10 to 15 percent, if not more, of agency people have left the agency business altogether. And many more are seeking new jobs. Agencies have long been tough places to work, low hours, low job security. But they used to be fun places to work with lively and sociable people, with smart, fashionable offices, meals out in restaurants, parties. But all that got stripped away in the pandemic, leaving only the low salaries, long hours, and the isolation of working alone. We spoke to a PR firm in Glasgow three weeks ago who told us that more than 20% of their employees were suffering from mental health problems. And because the clients are back inevitably wanting work that's better, faster and cheaper all at the same time, our people are exhausted. But they've also wised up. The recent survey by Edelman and Zeno found that while 90% of agency bosses, I'm talking rough figures, wanted their people to return to the office, 90% of agency staff favoured the option of working from home, at least some of the time. I talked to the CEO of a MarTech company last week, recruiting for developers, who told me that the great majority of applications he receives specify at the top of the resumes they will not even consider in-office work. Agency staff in the US, whether or not they're seeking new jobs, are widely reported to be demanding the contractual right to work in the office or the right to work at home. And if they don't get it, they want higher salaries. But what's really the best solution for employers and for employees? Well, in, a, in two or three minutes, we'll be bringing together four agency owners who have made their decision to share why they decided as they have, as well as the practical challenges and consequences of what they decided. But before that, I'd just like to share a few perspectives from people outside our industry, which have opened my eyes to some of what is happening in our industry. And if you could uh, bring up the slides, please, now. Okay, and uh, move on one slide. That was the title. And two slides. And one more. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at perspectives uh, from people who I've heard recently in conferences. And we've heard many, and some of them have been brilliant. And it's just a little thought from each one to set the tone and to set the context of what we're going to be talking about. This lady is an inspiring lady called Dr. Garima Sarai. Um, she was trained at the University of Delhi and she now is a research 
uh, doctor at the uh, University of Cambridge, and she's working on a project called Youth and Work in the Global South. And um, so what she said, you know, she said the future of work will be driven more by demographics than by technology. It's not often what we hear, but it's absolutely what we should be taking account of. And she quotes a figure that the World Bank uh, say that out of a billion people who will enter the labor market in the next 10 years, only 400 million, 40%, are likely to find formal employment. So when we are thinking about people working in the office or working from home, um, the bigger issue is going to be whether they are working in a company at all. Uh, something for us to think about. Next slide, please. This is another amazing lady called Alice Enders, and uh, I heard her talk at the IPA's FWorks conference. If you can find those talks online, um, the conference is about two weeks ago. It's brilliant, and uh, I will share links later. Um, and what uh, Alice pointed out was something quite surprising. She was looking at the UK and she's saying, you know, you'd assume that recovery is usually driven from big cities. But in the case of the pandemic in the UK at the moment, it's actually uh, being shown by real time analysis that spending is recovering faster in suburbs and smaller towns. People enjoy the fresh air, more ventilation, less crowds in small spaces and shorter commutes, which gives them confidence to come back to the office. Um, I heard a, there's another consultant I've also we work with called Veronica Heaven, um, who introduced me to the concept of 15 minute cities. Less centralized countries like Germany may overtake the UK and the US with huge mega cities like London and New York, because people do not want to commute uh, for 45 to minutes to an hour on a subway train. She also had another, I thought, really interesting figure about returning to the office because she's noted that it's much more prevalent in the US and the China, where, in her words, authoritarian and hierarchical cultures are more prevalent than European cultures, which tend to have a more consensual approach. So when we read that, you know, everyone in China has gone back to the office, uh, or a lot of people in the US are going back to the office, we may expect that Europeans may not follow that pattern. I've tended to leave out uh, from our work at the moment, Asia and the Southern Hemisphere, not because they're not important, but because uh, due to the fact of COVID being much more prevalent there, they haven't had quite the choice that we have had. Next slide. Um, this quick one is just from Neil Davidson, who's one of the high, um, the high flyers and senior people at, at uh, Dell Tech. Um, and, uh, you know, he writes people and developers and data technologists, the people who are in short supply, they won't stick around if they can't work in the way that they choose. Um, and it's saying, you know, as he said, and put it bluntly, one in three of my employees will walk if asked to return to the office full time. Um, Next slide, please. Dennis Terrian, uh, who's uh, a big cheese at Salesforce Europe and Middle East. Um, and Salesforce has probably one of the hugest data sets uh, that, you know, is around. And he is saying the, the, the jury is clearly out. You know, we've got 20% say they want to work from home. 30% say they want to work in the office. 50% uh, can't quite make up their mind or want a hybrid solution. Next slide. This is one insight which I really enjoyed. Um, this is our, our good friend Tamara Littleton, who's the CEO of the Social Element in London, talking at the Ag Agency Nomics Conference. And she pointed out, you know, working from home can benefit people with disabilities. Um, Paul mentioned that, that at the start, you know, diversity, equality, inclusion is going to be so critical, not just because it's the right thing for us to do, but because companies already in the US and increasing elsewhere will demand it in their supply chain. Now, disabled people are often the forgotten people um, when looking at minorities. You know, there's a lot of attention given, um, maybe it's still not enough, but there is towards gender equality, ethnic uh, equality. Um, but equality for people with disabilities is something really to be taken into mind, especially if you want to meet the quotas. Uh, for companies looking at improving diversity and social consciousness within their supply chain. Next slide. 
Um, well, here we are. This is Mark Reed. We all know him. I like this picture, not because I picked it because he looked a bit slumpy, but because it's actually the, the first picture on WPP's website a couple of days ago. Um, and he said, you know, listening to him at the Cables reports, I'm not worried about economic recovery. I'm worried about retaining good people. And to illustrate the point made earlier, um, in Q1 this year, WPP's actively working headcount was down 40% year on year. Some of that may now have recovered, uh, but it just shows, you know, what is the world's biggest holding company boss is more worried about headcount than he is more worried, than he's worried about the global economy. Um, and last, the, uh, last, last individual, Kai Fu Lee. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and uh, he's, I'm a total fan of this guy. He runs a company called Sino Ventures. He's one of the few Chinese entrepreneurs who still speaks his mind openly. And um, yeah, he, what he points out to us is that, you know, if we look at the acronyms, acronyms here, you know, working from home or working in the office are only two points on a scale because actually the future of work is going to be driven as much by outsourcing, the BPO, and uh, RPA, robotic process automation. So today we're going to talk about whether our people should be in and out of the office, but um, the bigger context is whether they should be people at all. Um, next slide, please. And uh, this is going to be from a survey that we did ourselves and we'll make this available to people. I won't talk to it in detail. I'm just going to show one slide. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, that's the methodology. It was 170 or something agencies uh, around the world. So next slide of the first graph, please. Um, so yes, so these are the these are the results that we found. And um, you know what we saw uh, is this was a survey from 170 odd agencies last month. Um, so 65%, the blue lines are the positives, have staff now working in the office at least one day a week, but only 32% have 20% of staff or more now working in the office four or five days a week. 50% of staff now working in the office at least one day a week, 47%, about a half. 50% of staff now working in the office four or five days a week, less than 20%. Now, some of that is people from the Southern Hemisphere who by governments or, or medical situations aren't able to have people working in the office. But what it does show us is the jury is out and there is really no clear pattern yet. So at that point, um, if we could take the slides off the screen and um, bring up my four panelists, please. Thank you. So um, we're gonna introduce um, four uh, people. Um, and uh, because of what we mentioned earlier, We've chosen people from Europe and North America because they are in a position of being able to choose whether they work in the office um, or whether they prefer to work remotely. Um, we're going to listen to um, Carol Levine from Energy PR in Canada, to Valerie Chan from Platform in the US, uh, from Graham Goodkin, Gra sorry, Graham Goodkind uh, from Frank PR in the UK, and from Christian Giuseppe um, of Panama PR in Germany. And they're all agency uh, CEOs, chairman, MDs. So they are the decision makers. And uh, I've asked them because there's a spectrum of views across the panelists about what should be done, and also a spectrum of experience about what they are doing. So I'm gonna ask each panelist in turn uh, to speak for a few minutes, um, not more than five, about four minutes is our kind of best estimate, but um, I'll leave it to your discretion uh, about what you're doing, what's been your own agency's experience. So if you just tell us a little bit about your agency, you know, who you are, what you do, but then what have you done and where do you sit on the spectrum of people working in the office or people working remotely? And I think it will be very interesting, but I think it's not a question of who's right and who's wrong. It's a question of each one of these individuals and their agencies offers us something really interesting to learn. Carol, can we start with with you, Carol Levine? Don't forget to put your put your mics on everybody. By the way, when you talk. Oh. Thank you, Julian. You're a tough act to follow because 
so much of what you've said in your opening remarks reflect uh, the situation that we look at. Um, when I was doing some reading over the weekend, I found on my uh, Twitter uh, this interesting comment from someone I know quite well who's um, also in the communications. And it says, I've never been so grateful for a remote job, which has been remote since a decade pre-COVID. However, I have no intentions of visiting my client's offices without the assurance that everyone in the building is vaccinated. So I guess that means never. And I think that that speaks to um, the concern that we have for our, for our staff um, and uh, for their health and for their safety. Uh, despite, you know, one of the comments we've talked about going back to the office, but no one has really mentioned the pandemic in terms of vaccination rates, uh, health, um, you know, breakthrough infections and so on. And so there still is a very great fear, certainly in Canada, uh, despite the fact that we have about 73% of all Canadians are doubly vaccinated, there still seems to be this lingering fear. Um, another comment I read recently is we don't, we report to client problems, not to offices. And I think that pretty much sums up um, how energy is, has operated over the past 18 months. Before COVID, I think the notion of a physical office got a lot of attention. Where it was located, what it looked like, um, you know, should there be private offices? Should there be a big, uh, you know, um, open hub? And, you know, we've gone through all of that. It was all about the office. Um, the office was part of our identity. Uh, certainly in Canada, you know, where your office was located, if it was on Bloor Street in Toronto, um, if it had bricks and beam, you know, wood floors, if it had a stocked fridge, these were all the subtleties that were there that were so important. And it almost defined who and what an agency was all about. Um, and to a certain extent, we often joked about the, the practitioner that works out of their basement. It was, it was a stigma to work from home um, and clients. Uh, did not favor their employees working from home at all. You know, the, the managers wanted to walk down the hallway and see that people were sitting at their desks and on their phone and doing whatever they had to do. So the office was, was really, I guess, the cornerstone of an agency uh, to a great extent. We were founded in Montreal. Um, in the early 80s, there was a huge shift of business from Montreal to Ontario. And we, as a small independent agency, felt the need to do that, which was really risky because we didn't have a holding company safety net to help us. But we, we did, you know, we did the move. And so we were faced with two offices, two staff teams, insurance, rent, and everything. So one of the things that we, you know, we faced uh, with this pandemic is looking at, we're paying rent, but nobody's there. And every month I wrote a check to our landlord who was, you know, who had no sympathy at all for the fact that clients had cut back some work. Um, the government at that point was not uh, providing any type of rent relief. And um, the office was vacant and the epiphany was that we were still doing great work. We were still being creative. We were still connecting. We connected more with clients because we not only picked up the phone to speak to them, we saw them on Zoom. We saw them in their own homes. So we, we had a lot of personal connection. We saw what people looked like. There was a lot of, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the right word, but there was a lot of empathy one to the other. And yet we still got our work done. Um, what I learned over the last 18 months and, and sort of it gave me an opportunity to reflect, we didn't need the big Xerox copier. We didn't need reams of paper. We didn't need, um, you know, the letterhead. We didn't need the envelopes. We functioned very, very well um, remotely. And so looking forward and, and, you know, for the immediate term, uh, certainly, uh, we have no intention of going back to the office. 
it makes no sense to pay the rent, the insurance, and all of these things. Um, in Canada, of the 30 or so agencies that are part of the Canadian Council of Public Relations firms, I don't think but a handful have gone back officially as of yet. Nobody has made that commitment. Everybody is still in that wait and see mode. Um, and from a hiring point of view, look at our talent pool potential. You know, we always worried about uh, somebody in, you know, if you know our city, um, you know, young people generally can't afford a home, but they can afford it in the suburbs, which is, you know, an hour commute, maybe even longer. And even if you live in the city, the traffic and, and the daycare issues and all of these other factors. So um, it's, it's such a huge relief, I think, to individuals. Now, that doesn't mean that we won't see each other. We just may not see each other in the office. So we'll look at hub meetings. We'll, we'll either rent a WeWork or, as Julian mentioned, this three, uh, three plus two scenario. I think these are all viable options to keep people together, to, to have them feel uh, connected. I think um, trust becomes a huge factor when people are working from home. You need to have a staff that can manage through that flexibility, um, that liberation as an example, and, and still produce uh, good work. And, you know, the idea that there is a huge um, talent um, gap, uh, very hard to find individuals to work, and uh, we need to make it as, you know, as convenient as possible. Um, so I'm not, I'm not saying that we will never be back uh, in an office, but uh, for now, energy will be working from home. Thank you, Carol. That's uh, put out the stall pretty well, I thought. Um, and actually, I'm going to ask now Valerie, Valerie Chan. Um, Valerie, I think you're you're in San Francisco, but I can't tell for sure because you I, work in I many am places. In, uh, well, right now I'm in Hawaii. Um, I'm just visiting for a funeral, but um, I am based out of San Francisco. That's correct. But we so, have people um, in the we have people in New York. We have people in the Midwest. We have people in San Francisco, LA, um, as well as in London. So, um, in terms of how platform was set out, we're a virtual agency. We started um, to be a virtual agency from the start, and I, I think. Um, a lot of things came into play. Um, I came from a technology background and because I was kind of born and bred in technology, had a little stint in, in law and then went back into doing agency work, um, be, being set up as a virtual agency came natural. Um, but there were many considerations in place and um, I'll talk about how the pandemic affected us in just a second. But in terms of what it meant, um, we made sure that we had the right infrastructure in place, making sure that people had the, um, the appropriate security measures in place. We wanted to make sure that we had um, a, an employee handbook that allowed for a remote work policy, um, certain standards in place on how you can, can talk with clients, what the, the standard of client care was, that sort of a thing. And it became obvious to us of, in terms of competing with traditional agencies that we had to work better, we had to work smarter and we had to provide higher level, a higher level of client service. And that um, going before pre-pandemic was a little bit difficult in terms of perception. Um, we, had, we had virtual offices at remote, um, at Regis facilities throughout the United States um, and then, uh, Regis also has a partnership with Spaces, and so if people wanted to go into the office, they could. Um, however, you know, most people wanted to work from home. Um, the other thing is that we made sure that people were working within a certain hour, um, just, you know, not standard nine to five or longer, depending on, on what it meant. But even though we've set these policies in place pre-pandemic, 
Um, what was interesting is that from the client perspective, quality of care became a huge issue um, in terms of perception. Are they going to function? Um, are these teams um, that platform has going to function cohesively as a team? Are they going to collaborate? Are they going to provide you know, better work, good quality work as, as an agency that has a brick and mortar business. And so pre-pandemic, that became a huge perception. However, once um, I was able to apply my law degree and we focused more in the legal and regulatory space as a virtual agency and internet security, um, uh, because of the specialty, because of the technology background, we were able to create this niche of higher level of client service for the legal and regulatory industry. So it's very specific, right? And as a virtual agency, because all our clients are have have um, you know actually have a global presence, like one of our clients is LexisNexis, right? And the Relics family, it you know it becomes easier to provide. And, and actually manage the client and, you know, be available for them. And we don't have that, we didn't have that perception. Come the pandemic, um, what we found was because we had set up the, the infrastructure for a remote working environment, it just was easier to, to take on more client work and to provide better service. Yes, we double down. Yes, we work longer hours. Did we lose clients? Our clients actually doubled down because they knew that we could actually work in a remote working environment to get the word out. And we became more creative on how we collaborated and how we actually worked with clients. So um, that said, was there burnout? Absolutely, absolutely. Were people kind of sick of stuck to their chairs? Yes, absolutely. However, we were able to ride out the pandemic pretty well. And this just this year um, have about 30% growth, right? Which was actually pretty tremendous in the era of a pandemic. So, um, you know, I, I'm really fortunate to have set up a policy, I set up policies and procedures in place and, you know, been aware of, you know, what to do to hire, but, um, you know, the question that people should consider is, is having a virtual agency going to impact me, you know, from a collaboration perspective? Is it going to impact me, you know, from a hiring perspective or is it going to benefit me? But also, you know, after the pandemic actually, you know, ceases to exist, which may be in the next three or four years, you know, is there going to be a stigma to 100% virtual agency? And what do you need to do to ensure that you can compete with a brick and mortar agency if, if that comes about? And so um, I think we just need to think about what that actually looks like. And I, I think from our perspective, you know, yes, while we're virtual, um, there's a part where having like a hybrid approach works really, really well. And so while even though we're virtual, we do meet or we did we did pre-pandemic on a monthly basis for those those folks who are in specific regions. So for San Francisco, for example, or New York, or whenever there was a trade show, all our teams would come together, all the team members would come together, and then we'd have a, a meetings um, after meetings just to collaborate, or we'd have, uh, you know, a white, you know, a whiteboard online that you guys could, uh, we, I can give you the technology links afterwards, um, so that you could collaborate um, with, but, you know, that is, like having having a client come into the office is also super important too, which I will not, you know, like, yes, it's easier to have a conversation now, but you you can't beat the face-to-face -face communication that you can have with a client. So just just a few things, you know, in terms of considerations for after we emerge pre um, after the pandemic. So, um, but those are considerations that we have as well. Valerie, thank, thank you very much for that. That's really stimulating. It's interesting to see the difference between an agency that was 
purpose built, if you like, almost um, for remote working and one that's finding its its way. Most of us are finding our way. Um, some of us are finding different ways. And uh, I must say, one of my favorite people to have on a panel is um, is Graham from Frank. And the last time we had him on a panel about the role of the creative director in a PR firm, and he kicked it off by saying, well, we don't have a creative director because we don't think we should because everybody should be creative. Um, so, Frank, I hope you're not going to tell us that you're all working uh, remotely and that you've got a slightly better way to do it. Um, how is your experience? Uh, what are you doing? I'd still say, by the way, that we don't need a creative director and um, and have a creative culture instead. But that's uh, that's still one for another day. No, ironically, today you'll see that I am actually working from home, um, even though I'm going to talk about the benefits of why we are an office based company. Um, I'm only working from home as it goes because, uh, ironically, given the subject, I contracted COVID over the weekend. So uh, obviously, I'm not allowed out. I'm not allowed out of my house for ten days. I'm feeling all right. Don't worry about it. But um, uh, I guess the first point to make, really, that I'm going to make is is that in this industry there are so many different types of agencies, and to have a one size fits all solution for every agency is um, is kind of not going to work. Valerie has just talked about having a a completely virtual agency, even in with PR, even within PR, there's public affairs agencies, corporate agencies, consumer agencies, press office agencies. We're a creative agency. So we're, you know, kind of have got our own niche within a very wide and broad spectrum of companies. And and for a creative ideas led agency, um, and, you know, when I, it's all about coming up with those great moments and stories that create bars, get people talking. Um, we do that best when people are together and the more we're together, the more we do it, the more we're together in brainstorms and creative sessions, the better when we held them remotely as we had to, because we weren't allowed into the office. To be honest, they were rubbish. Um, no one could bounce off each other, build on a thought. I really felt we were being creatively compromised. And those moments of serendipity that you get with people in a room together, you know, someone says something, someone builds on that and another person, they just don't happen um, on Zoom or, or those, you know, similar platforms. And, all, you know, those, those, those also, should add, those creative moments of inspiration don't just happen in a brainstorm. They happen all day, every day when people are together. You have a chat with a colleague as you're making a coffee, you're going to walk to get a sandwich um, for lunch. These are all moments of opportunity that you get when you throw lots of talented people together. Um, for us, it's how the magic happens. Um, and creativity is something really for us that's always on. So not being together during the pandemic, um, I felt inhibited our competitive advantage, um, which is that we're better, if you like, creatively than other 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 agencies. And and that competitive advantage was potentially not as strong as what it was. So when when the government allowed us to and when the regulations allowed us to, we resumed regular working and um, when it was safe to do so. Um, and we continue like that. And and you know what? It's not it's not really a big deal for us. So when everyone talks about it, I sort of haven't really got involved in the discussion or debate because that was always that always worked for us and you know I, I sort of a bit of me doesn't get what all the big fuss is about if you if you ask me before the pandemic you know should you have a virtual agency should you work from home whatever i'd like to have made the decisions pre-pandemic and then set up our agency accordingly than because of a pandemic and a, a kind of a knee-jerk reaction um, to a crisis that's hit us all almost and i don't think it's better working from home and i don't think it's better for frank personally um they talk a lot about flexibility i mean at frank if you wanted to work from home or wherever you wanted to work to pre-pandemic that was fine it wasn't you know if you had a big deck to write if you kind of want to do some planning time if you've got a delivery of a sofa coming tomorrow morning and you wanted to work from home for a day that was absolutely a-okay so I, I sort of don't get what's changed. We've we've had to reiterate that to people. We unlock we launched a Flexi Frank package a couple of weeks ago, which talked about all the different flexibility within. But we always had that. I mean, we just maybe had to say it a bit more overtly than we ever had before. We also threw in other things like unlimited holidays and also a free tattoo after one year service. But that's another story. Um, but I didn't want to break. I didn't want to bake the working from home. Uh, uh, high or a hybrid system into the Frank uh, culture. I didn't think it worked for us. I get how it works for others, but it, it didn't work for us. And from a people's perspective, yeah, our experience was, yeah, we probably had a couple of people that have left 
uh, the agency as a result. And, you know, they've moved to other agencies that are that are offering working from home opportunities. And that's fine. And they've jumped up. OK, uh, I kind of you know, expected that to an extent. But for me, keeping our company culture um, together was 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 the prime focus and the most important thing. But we also be inundated, to be honest, with lots of perhaps less senior, often younger people who want to work at Frank, who want to be back together with people, who want to be in a learning environment, who want to be back in an office, who didn't enjoy working from home or hybrid systems one little bit, the mental health suffered, and all the data that you read, lots of surveys actually back that up. They weren't enjoying it and it was bad. And 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 for us, again, it's it's horses for courses. For us as an agency, having exciting, energetic, passionate junior people who we can mould, help grow and develop, that's always been the lifeblood of an agency that uh like Frank, and being in an office is brilliant to do that. And I would say necessary um, to do that for growth and development. I mean, I learned everything. I learned how to sell into a journalist from listening to a chap called Julian Henry, who's gone on to do brilliant things and listening to him sell into a journalist. There was no one better than him. I, I learned from my old boss, Samantha Royston, uh, and Lim Franks about how to sell anything to a client and how to talk to a client. That all happened via osmosis and being there in the same environment. And for us, that can't happen uh, on, on Zoom. And the final point I want to make is the bottom line is it's fun. It's really, really good fun working in an office every day with brilliant people, with brilliant energy in a brilliant environment. And uh, I think if we get a bit too carried away working from home hybrid systems, unless you're set up for that purpose, we miss out on all the fun. And you know what? I'm too old now. I don't want to miss out on fun anymore. <laughs> well, thanks, Frank. I, I can't see you as someone who would miss out on fun, to be honest. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah. I, I would say the same for other people who perhaps do work more from home too. But um, no, thank you, thank you very much for that, um, Christian. I'm going to ask you now because uh, so we wanted to have someone who's got something of a hybrid agency, um, but with a very specific twist, uh, which intrigued me. Um, and Christian, please tell us. Uh, Panama PR in Germany. How have you gone about this and what is special about the way that you've approached this question? Oh, and by the way, if you want to use the two slides, just say, because we've got them in reserve if you'd like to show them. Okay. Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you, Frank. I am a fun person. Uh, thank you, Graham. Sorry, Frank PR. <laughs> Graham. I hope um, I will be perceived as a fun person even after my few words. Um, we opted for the complete opposite. Um, we were forced into it um, by the pandemic lockdowns and decided in last October to go completely virtual from an office only um, mode of operation. Um, and let me tell you a story. I went, um, I participated in the Network One's Indie Summit in 2018 in London. And before the summit, um, together with a Swedish friend, um, we went to see five London-based agencies and we were very, very astonished to meet only one of them, one out of five, in office spaces, in their rented office spaces. The others were in co-working environments. Most of them we met in a bar or in uh, clubs. Um, so, and the, the, the business cards they handed over to us traditional Germans um, coming from Stone Age had no physical address on them. They had social links, they had uh, mobile numbers, no physical landline numbers. Um, and that seemed to be a new trend. And we handed over our business cards with phone and fax numbers on them and wrote manually the mobile numbers on them. I don't know if you remember that embarrassing time. So, um, we were truly embarrassed. And I went back um, to Stuttgart. I think uh, we're kind of the, the um, exotic agency here, not being in one of the, the, the global epicenters of communication. Um, but we suffer the same, but slightly different problem. Um, the, the talent crunch is, is here slightly, um, slightly different from yours because when mainly not compu competing with other agencies, there are no big agencies here, um, but with industry. Um, you know, we're automat automobile city, so Porsche is here, Mercedes is here, Bosch is here, but also IBM and HP, and all the surrounding infrastructure of suppliers, global suppliers, 
and they have a lot of money. They throw willingly at our people. So um, the talent crunch is present in a, in a different setting. Um, and I never forgot about this visit to London and I always dreamt of building a remote agency because it gives so much um, advantages, challenges and, and um, you know, competitive advantages. But I lacked the, um, I don't know, the brains. <laughs> the, the, um, my brain was in a small entrepreneur's mindset, you know, um, and this does not contain 100, the 100% trust to everybody mode. Um, so I feared letting go people um, to let them work wherever and whenever they want to. And I, I thought of the rules and regulations we would have to set up and um, we lacked the tools and boom, the pandemic hit and we had to introduce it and to find it in, in, in a very little time. And still there was this fear of letting go, you know, giving trust, 100% trust to everybody. Um, they will do the best they can for our clients and for our mandates. Um, and then I, during my research, a lot of reading, a lot of listening to podcasts, a lot of um, questioning other people, um, I ran into this podcast where, featuring SAP's former HR VP. And she made two clear statements. If you want to go remotely, find your company's specific set of rules and tools. You need to do it your way. And the second was even shorter, but more encouraging to me, um, just go for it, try it out. You may come back to point zero at any given time. If it does not work, you go back to the old work in the office um, policy. And that helped me and, um, and Mike and my colleague um, in managing Panama PR to, to go 100% virtual. And we call it Panama New Work, Panama PR New Work, and gave us very, very little rules. That's a chat um, in the morning where you sign in and give an indication until when you will be there, reachable for your, for your colleagues. Um, a second rule is um, you give priority to team and client um, requirements over your personal agenda. Um, not always, not, in, not at every single minute, but you give preference and you return calls you receive and you, re you answer emails, of course. And if you're not available, you'll, you will indicate that on the chat. Um, and Besides that, that's it. And we set up some um, KPIs, but I would like to leave that for later, Julian, if, if, if that's okay with you, um, because I may look as the hyper-organized German um, who, <laughs> who defined indicators measuring the, the productivity. Let me say this first. Um, to me, it's more fun to, to better be able to integrate my personal life and my professional life and to, you know, to have breaks in the day because my brain works well at 10 a.m. but not at 8 a.m. Not always. If, I'm, if I need to go into client meetings, I, I can do it. Um, and I'm very creative and very productive late in the evenings. Nobody else is of my team, but I am. Um, and so I choose the liberty of um, hopping on and off during a long working day. Um, to be more productive, to have more fun. But the one aspect I'm really missing, and that's where I, I fully support Graham and um, Carol and all. Valerie, I'm not sure. Valerie is very much in favor of working remotely, um, is the, the personal interaction is the problem. And the challenge is really how to create positive momentum at distance how to keep the team spirit up. And by that, I mean, um, you know, emotional attachment, empathy within a team, within a working group. That's things that I value very highly and um, they are equally important as, as the fun of working together with creative people. So indicators, if you want to see them, I can give them to you, but um, for the time, this is my statement. Christian, I just want to ask you, one: did you overcome your fear that the people could not be trusted? Yes, fully. Yes. 
Good. Um, it shows that people, um, and, and you know, it's not because of my obligations or my set of rules. It's because of clients' demands. It's because of deadlines. It's because of um, demand of creativity, of being part of clients' structures. And, and um, you know, we, we live with clients. We work with them as often as integrated teams. So it's not really my job to keep them in a good mood and running at high speed. It's mostly, my, my job is done by our clients very well. And probably one, one word um, we have, what helped also is we have 60% international clients. So most of our, um, the, the people we work with on a daily basis are very far from Stuttgart. Um, that helped, but I just did not know how to organize ourselves differently. So thanks to what happened last year, we're here. Great. Thank you. Um, we don't particularly have questions from the audience here, but uh, I know one or two of you would like to add one or two things. Barry, I know there's something in your mind, and uh, I'm going to ask everybody before we go if there's something else that you would like to add. Um, yeah, I, I thank you, Julian. I, a couple of things I think just have been brought up, been brought up by the other panelists that actually kind of really kind of resound and and maybe in everybody's mind how do you actually foster collaboration how do you foster culture especially in a virtual environment and and what do you do to co you know create a cohesive team in terms of client service which i um didn't address um one is by i think especially with our team, it's 100% accountability and relying on and trusting that our team is actually going to perform within the rules that we've set out. And, and they provide and, and ask the smart questions. So it's about who you hire as part of your team and, and what is the talent like. And so like one of the things that we've been able to do is take a different way of approaching hiring in addition to the types of hires that we have. So um, a lot of the account managers that we have have are more senior talent that want the flexibility, but also want the creativity and cohesion of working with a team. Um, the other thing is to, I, I can't stress enough, a collaborative whiteboards that actually help. Um, and making sure that, and going back to the hiring side, making sure that you have emotionally intelligent people. Um, I, I've written about this a couple of times, um, but I can't stress to you enough especially in a virtual environment, your EQ has to be that much higher. You, you, it, it, you, a person won't be able to survive in a virtual culture if they don't have that EQ. Um, and that's pretty much the bottom line because you have to intuit what a person's thinking and saying. Like a text can be misinterpreted, an email can be misinterpreted. And even, you know, you need to monitor your team's Zoom fatigue, for example, is should you, be online or should you not be online? Is it time to actually be in person to do a collaboration session or can you do it via virtual whiteboard? You know, those are questions as an agency owner that you need to consider to build that culture. And then what are other defined processes or other design gifts that you could give to people to incentivize them, right? It, you know, the incentives become a little bit different, but I think when you look at, at, at least for the states, I, I honestly don't know what it's like in other territories. Um, the idea of commuting, the idea of incentivization turns out to be different. It's Yes, it could be monetary, but it also is collaboration-based collaboration as well as community-based. So this new generation of, of talent that's coming through all our agencies that are actually looking to go into an agency are, are looking for creative ideas that we just need to get more creative on how to incentivize our people to collaborate as well as to perform. So, um, and obviously um, the type of service that we provide provides um, and the quality of service that we provide as, as a bar, as an agency owner is super important because that, that actually defines the work product that we have and the reputation that we have um, as an agency. So I just wanted to add that in because, you know, this, this particular talent that's coming through now pr pr um, post pandemic becomes more of a, um, you know, becomes more of an opportunity for us to figure out ways of creating creativity without, you know, the four walls around us. So I just want to throw that out there. Oh, thank you very much, Valerie. Um, 
Carol, I think you you should have possibly the last word uh, because you had to speak first and you've heard everybody else. Um, any points you'd like to pick up? Uh, agency. Well, I, I would just sure. I, I would just like to tell Christian, um, and, and I really uh, enjoyed that presentation about you know just go for it. Um, but we try to um, we try to be in each other's lives from from that. Um, complicity point of view. And we celebrate birthdays with virtual backgrounds. We send cupcakes when it's someone's birthday. Uh, we get together for, you know, to go to a bar or have a drink or have a dinner. Um, but it's also recognizing people. So we probably overcompensate on that, you know, sending a nice surprise package, uh, totally unexpected. Somebody gets a delivery. You know, these are the kinds of things that make a team feel like they are are one that they're unified we also share each other's you know difficulties people i mean it's been a rough road for so many people over the last 18 months um you know one of our staff has family in india you know she had her in-laws and her parents in hospital at the same time fortunately everybody was fine but people are going through this anxiety and there was a lot of a lot of emotional support. I think you can still give it um, in a remote uh, in a remote way, but this has uh, been very helpful. Great. We have about one minute. If anybody would like to put their hand up for one point, uh, Graham, please. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I guess my last my last point, which I sort of touched on, is is culture, and I, I kind of I love what everyone else is saying. And as I said at the start, you know, different agencies have different models, and everyone, I guess, can make it work. Um, for them, for me, agency culture is such a massive thing. In certainly in the UK market, there are some really powerful, strong cultures, and I could see working remotely the potential for the Frank culture to evaporate a little bit. And I, you know, I was concerned about that. And I think you can become much of a muchness. Obviously, every agency cares about their staff. I think you know a lot of emotional intelligence from a lot of agency leaders, empathy, all those sorts of things I saw in droves, but. The culture to me is in is is important. I think for me, a lot of other agencies, particularly in the UK, so UK Remark, have tried to do this working from home bit. And I get a call once a week from an agency founder or CEO saying, "GG, how how can we get back into the office again? How did you get people back into the office again?" And um, you know, I sort of say, "Well, we just did it. We didn't really do anything. We just were like that beforehand, and things changed. We went back in." So I think a lot of people are trying to do it because I think to use. Julian, you started off with a Shakespearean quote. Maybe I'll end with a Shakespearean quote, or at least I think it's Shakespearean. The problem <laughs> with an agency that was not a uh, working from home business or a remote business trying to be one is you get a lot of things wrong and it's very hard to make it work. Or as Shakespeare might have said, I think he did say it, I think there's many a slip, twixt cup and lip. And I think that is uh, one of the big drawbacks with agencies going working from home or hybrid. Fantastic. Great, great way to end, Graham. Thank you very much. And uh, I can really only end with uh, an appeal to Paul. Please, Paul, fix this conversation should obviously have gone over on in the coffee break and continued over to dinner. So let's get us all together again next year. And um, I will be very more than pleased uh, to buy a dinner for all my panelists if they will make it off to DC or wherever we hold it next year. Thanks very much to everybody, uh, to Carol, uh, to Valerie, um, to Graham and uh, to Christian. Fantastic panel. We learned a lot. Thank you.